Okay, so today we'll be talking about specific standardized tests, and this lecture is really going to prepare you for your case study assignment that's going to be due next week. So you might want to take a look at that assignment as we go through this, this PowerPoint and make sure you understand what we're going to be doing next week. So, let's see. So first off, when we talk about standardized tests, what do we mean by standardized? Right. Standardized means that we're talking about a test that's given in a standardized way. It's given the same way across lots of different contexts in the same ways. So this, this case study will involve both um, nationally normed um, tests given by school psychologists as well as state accountability high stakes tests. Remember that we can classify tests in a number of ways. So when we're talking about criterion versus norm reference, what does that refer to? Right, criterion reference tests are tests that are um, evaluated based upon a set of criteria or a set of standards. So things like our FSA tests and classroom tests are based upon a set of criteria or standards. Norm reference tests are tests that are based upon a norming population or a sample. So when we're comparing students to each other, things like ability and IQ tests. And in this lecture, we'll also be talking about some norm reference achievement tests. So which leads us to what's the difference between an ability test and an achievement test. Right, so ability tests are tests that measure IQ or ability or kind of what kids are born with, how fast they can learn, um, versus achievement are what students have learned or what students have achieved. So ability are the things they're taught in school. Um, achievement are the things they're taught in school and ability are the things that they're kind of born with, right? So most of what we do in school are achievement tests, but ability are the things that are like IQ. We're talking about constructed or selected response, right? Constructed response are when the students have to come up with the answer themselves and selected or when they're selecting from a set of choices. We'll also talk about the difference between individually and group administered tests. So individually administered tests are given one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so a student's in a room by themselves with one person giving the test, and a group administered test are typically given either on a computer or on a test booklet and to a whole group of students at once. Although group administered tests, a group administered test could be given one on one, even though they're designed to be given as a group. And then we remember we're talking about state administered accountability high stakes tests, and those are different than standardized tests, right? Those don't always mean the same thing, even though sometimes we use those words interchangeably. So let's look at some examples of the tests. These are the tests that will be on the case study. These are the scores that you'll be interpreting this week. So the first one's the FSAs, right? We've talked a lot about this in our other lectures, so I'll just briefly review. It's the Florida Standards Assessment replacing the FCAT based upon the Common Core Standards in English Language Arts, Mathematics, and the end of course exams in Algebra and Geometry. We used to also give it in Algebra 2, but we've stopped giving that assessment in the state of Florida. Um, so the next one we'll talk about is the test of nonverbal intelligence, the TONY-3. So we hear nonverbal intelligence. What does that tell us? Is it ability or achievement? Intelligence should cue us in that we're talking about ability here, right? Intelligence is another word for ability. Um, it's given one-on-one, -on -one, um, and it's a visual administration. So you can kind of see over here we have um, a visual administration. So the student is shown this picture and they're supposed to pick which of these blocks down here goes and matches with this pattern, right? So it's a pattern administration. It's supposed to be, it's nonverbal, which means that it's without language. So this is a test that we, that we um, are, we give to students because no language is used. It's maybe seen to be more, more culturally fair. So it's without language. So um, theoretically, students who are non-English speakers would have the same chance of doing well on it as students who are native English speakers. Um, it's There is some debate about the construct of nonverbal intelligence and if that construct is a meaningful one for school. So it's basically pattern recognition. So um, what we found is that maybe this nonverbal intelligence isn't as linked to things that make students as successful in school as other 
ways that we can measure intelligence. However, if we have students who don't speak English and we don't have an intelligence test in their native language, this might be the most fair way that we could assess their intelligence. Again, no language is used um, and it takes about 30 minutes to administer to students is given one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but it doesn't require any special training to give, so a classroom teacher could give this test. It doesn't require a school psychologist. Okay, so the next test we're going to talk about is the um, Torrance Test of Creative Thinking Figural Forms. So this is a measure of creativity, so it's a standardized measure of creativity, which I know some of you are thinking, wow, a standardized test of creat creativity, that seems to be like an oxymoron. Um, and I really like this because it does give us a way to really objectively measure creativity and to think about creativity um, in a way that is measurable. So divergent thinking is um, one way to think about creativity. And um, it produces a standard score and a percentile ranking, so it's a norm-referenced measure of creativity. Um, and, it, and it's a group administered, so there's a booklet for each child to complete, and it takes about an hour and a half. Um, and it can be given um, from about grades, I think grades second, um, all the way through adulthood. So here's the sample question. So you can see that on the left there's a series of lines and little boxes, and it says, complete the following pictures. Try to think of someone no one else, something no one else will draw. So the idea is the student would complete each of these pictures and they'd have about a half an hour. So if we look at that middle one with the V, right? So if I turn that into a Pac-Man, I'm not gonna get any points for it because kind of everyone would think of turning that into Pac-Man, right? But if I turn that into an alien from outer space with all these antenna and uh, I combine it with another pick, another box and, um, He's exploring a new space creature, and there's lots of elaboration. I'm going to score a lot of points. So the idea is that the more creative these answers are, and there's standardized ways and scoring booklets that tell us how to, how to score this, right? So there's three different sections. Each takes about a half an hour to score. So the downside is it takes a long time to score because you have to look at every single student's um, score sheet and responses and count up all of their things. Um, but it just gives a standardized way to look at this. Um, I have students ask me, well, is this achievement or ability? And it really depends on how you think of creativity. I think that most creative um, researchers, people who research creativity, would consider this to be uh, more achievement. We kind of believe that we can help students learn how to be more creative. Um, we also know that there's a pretty good link between creativity and intelligence in the sense that um, you have to have a certain amount of intelligence in order to think creatively, but after that, there's not a strong correlation. So after you reach about an IQ of 115 or 120, so you're a little bit above average, then there's not a strong correlation between creativity and intelligence. So, and we can all think of really intelligent people who really aren't that creative, and we can think of other people who are really, really creative, but maybe not as smart as other people that we know. So, the idea being that there's a link between creativity and intelligence, but it's also um, not a strong link, if that makes sense. So again, just knowing that this is one way we might um, be thinking about giftedness and creativity, and also that this is one measure that you'll see um, on your um, case study report and thinking about what you might do for a kid who's highly creative. Okay. The next test we're going to talk about is the WISC. So the WISC, um, which, which stands for the Wexler Intelligence Scales for Children, um, and this is really the gold standard for intelligence testing. Um, and the WISC is for children, I think, starting um, um, in first grade. So there's a, there's a WAIS, which is for children younger than first grade, and then there's a test for adults um, that's also a Wexler scale. So we can kind of take kids from infanthood all the way to adulthood on these kind of intelligence scales. But we're going to talk about the WISC because it's most commonly used in schools. It's individually administered. It must be administered by a trained psychologist. So I'm not actually qualified. I haven't gone through the training to give the WISC, and, but school psychologists have. So it's pretty expensive to give because we have to have someone who's been trained. We have to pay them to give this test. Um, it is a measure of intelligence, which should clue us in that it's an ability test, right? 
There's several sub subtests, um, some of which are timed, some of which are not timed. So all in all, this test can take between 60 and 90 minutes to administer, kind of depending on the age of the child. Um, all of these subtests are theorized to measure this all to measure intelligence. So if we see large discrepancies between the subtests, we might be considering that there's some sort of additional educational, cognitive, or learning disabilities, because we wouldn't expect there to be huge um, discrepancies. And when I'm talking about discrepancy, I'm really talking about more than a standard deviation difference in those subtest scores. So for example, if we saw large um, discrepancies lower on the tests that are timed, we might be considering that there's some sort of processing disorder or maybe ADD or ADHD for those students. Um, if we see um, problems maybe with working memory or those kinds of things, it can be an indication of a learning disability. So here's a sample item from the digit span task. So um, I would read these numbers 24, 3, 7, 12, and the student would need to respond um, with those numbers backwards. So they would say 12, 7, 3, 24. And that's a measure, again, of working memory, right? So the Wexler <laughs> conception of intelligence is really based upon, if we think about back to information processing theory, working memory, this idea that the more that I can hold in working memory, the more intelligent I am, the more that I can work with, right? I'm not a big fan of that theory, mostly because I don't think I have a really strong working memory and I think I'm pretty smart, so that kind of like self-preservation, right? No, um, but seriously, um, I think that these conceptions of intelligence are really focusing on some of these smaller, minor skills, and I'm not sure that they're really reaching those deeper, um, critical thinking areas that when we think of really intelligent people we're looking at, so, okay. Um, the COGAP, so this is the Cognitive Abilities Test. So again, what is the COGAP measure? Is it ability or achievement? Ability, right? And again, ability, it's a norm reference test, just like the WISC was, just like the Torrens Test of Creative Thinking. It's, an, it's a norm referenced ability test. It's group administered, though. So the advantage of the COGAT is that we could give this to an entire classroom of students at once. It doesn't have to be given by a trained psychologist. A classroom teacher could give it because it's just a series of test booklets. Um, they're vertically aligned. So this form six, level F, right? This is, um, I would give it to, you know, maybe, I think level F is maybe 13 year olds. So I give it to all the 13 year olds in the classroom, right? Um, but it would be aligned to the 12-year-old test or the 11-year-old um, test, right? Um, it, there's three subsections of the COGAT, a verbal section, a nonverbal section, and a quantitative section. So the nonverbal sections, much like we looked at with the, the Tony, with the pattern matching in the blocks. Um, the, the verbal section is a series of kind of verbal questions, right? Um, and then the quantitative question, I'll show you an example here. Um, a student is given two problems. Um, so 0 plus 3 and 3 plus 0, and their answer choices are 1 is greater than 2, 1 is less than 2, or 1 is equal to 2. And so it's not just that they can compute what 0 plus 3 is, but they, they, they can reason about how those two number equations are related to each other. And this is obviously um, a question that would be geared more towards that younger age set. Um, and the nice thing, the other cool thing about the cognitive abilities test is that it has the same norming population as the next test we're going to talk about. So let's look at this next test, um, which is called the ITBS or the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. So the Iowa Test of Basic Skills um, is an achievement test. And like I said, it has the same norming population as the COGAT. And the reason it's called the Iowa test is not because it's related to the state of Iowa, but because it was developed at the University of Iowa. So the COGAT and the University and the ITBS were both developed in the University of Iowa with those set of researchers. Um, so it doesn't have anything to do with the Iowa standards. Um, but so we have this achievement test and this ability test that are both norm referenced. And because they use the same norming populations, we can directly compare a score on the COGAT to a score on the ITBS. So we can directly compare ability to achievement. And what would it mean if a student had a high ability and they were lower performing in achievement? And when I say lower performing, I'm not talking about a few point score difference. I'm really talking about more than one standard deviation. So if I'm more than one standard deviation lower in achievement, it could mean a couple of things, right? And I'd really want to look at the rest of the students' scores and try to get a fuller picture. 
So I would expect a difference in scores with a learning disability, right? So if I was, if I had dyslexia, I'm going to have a lower reading score um, on my ITBS than I would on my COGAP, right? Um, also, if I had um, if I had ADHD, I'm not learning as much in my classroom. I might do fine on my intelligence testing, but I'm going to have a lower achievement because I'm not being able to pay attention as well. I'm not having as much opportunity to learn in my classroom. Um, I also might see a lower um, achievement score if I'm an English language learner. Um, but I would also, if I was an English language learner having difficulty with English, I would also expect that my intelligence score on the COGAT would be lower. I would expect to see a higher nonverbal score, but my verbal intelligence score would also be lower, right? I also might be, um, I might have, if I was just in poorer schools, my school educational background was lower, I would see a lower um, achievement score, right? So just thinking about the reasons why a student's score might be lower. So again, the ITBS is an achievement test. Um, it has measures in language, reading comprehension, mathematics, science, and social studies. Um, typically, we pay more attention to the reading and the math scores than the science and social studies scores, and that's because this is a national test. So if we think about state to state and variations in standards, reading and math stay really consistent, and that's why we have the common core in reading and math and not the other subjects quite as strongly, because math doesn't change a lot from state to state, we kind of learn math in a very predictable sequence, right? Same with reading. Reading gets, you get stronger at reading from grade level to grade level, right? But the order in which we teach science and social studies varies greatly <laughs> by state. So whether we start with biology and then physical science, um, and then we move on to chemistry, or if we do physical science first and then biology, that varies, right? And even more so with social studies. Do we talk about state history? Do we talk about US history, world history? Where does economics and government fit into all of those areas? That varies widely by state. So those concepts in the ITBS are less reliable at a national level because it really depends upon what concepts you were taught in your school. And there's just a lot of variation there. Okay, and so here's an example of a, of a math question on the um, ITBS, and you can see that this relies less on a reasoning skill and more upon basic calculations. Okay, now let's talk about the PBVT, which is the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. It's an individually administered test of receptive vocabulary. So it's, um, so we can see from this example, um, I would say something like, show me the picture of someone sleeping. And then the student, the child would sh hopefully picture, to point to the picture of the boy in the bottom left corner. And it's really measuring what words does the student understand. Um, and the way that these flip chart books work, and it's the same with the Tony, is that you start off, um, that depending on the child's age, you start off on a certain page. So each page gets successively harder. So the first page in the booklet's really easy, and the last page is the most difficult item on the test. But rather than having to go through all 200 or 300 questions on the test, we start off based upon the student's age. So the older the student is, the more we kind of assume that the student knows. And when we start off, um, if I start off, let's say, on item 15, um, I would make sure the first, I would say, if the student got the first five questions right, if the student misses an item in the first five, I would go back and start going further back until the student gets the gets five right in a row. Um, and once the student gets five right in a row, then I would assume that they would have gotten all the previous items correct, right? So I don't have to do all of the previous items. I can just assume they would get them right. And then I continue on until a student misses five wrong in a row. And once a student misses five wrong in a row, then I assume they wouldn't get any more right for the rest of the test. That way I don't have to go through all 200 items. Because you can imagine, if I have a child, that they're not going to sit still for that long. I have a short amount of time. That way um, I can kind of maximize the time that I'm giving the test and give them kind of a targeted set of, set of items, right? So that's how those flip chart items work. So again, this is a measure of receptive vocabulary. What students, what, um, 
what words the student understands. So we tend to give the PBVT to young children in early childhood preschool to see what vocabulary they have. We also give tests like this to students who are English language learners. So even before they can produce words, right, we could still measure what vocabulary they know, right? Um, there's another kind of complementary test called the expressive vocabulary test. And in this exam, in that test, there's only one picture per page and we ask the student to say the word. So if there's a picture of a dog, we'd want them to say dog, right? And that um, that's the skill of knowing and being able to produce the word. So typically we think that receptive vocabulary develops first and then expressive. Okay, then the final type of information that you'll get from your students um, is their report cards. And again, that's gonna vary depending on the age of the case you choose. Um, but what information can you get from a report card, right? So it tells us their achievement in school, right? Um, and um, I want to kind of go over that for most of your students, you'll get an A, B, C, or D. But for some of your younger students, you also might see grades that say E, S, N, and U. And that's just an alternate form of grades. So an E is excellent and S is satisfactory. An N is needs improvement and a U stands for unsatisfactory. So Sometimes we see those for conduct grades, and sometimes we see those for things like the specials classes, the electives like art, music, PE. It's just another grading system that we sometimes see in the primary grades. Um, what are some limitations of report card grade data? Well, of course, it's based upon the teacher's perceptions. So sometimes report cards are were based upon the teacher's um, likability of the student. It also might be based more upon the effort that the student puts in. So you might see kids with um, passing FSA scores and high achievement test scores, but failing in their report cards because they don't do things like, you know, turn in their homework, right? So we want to think about how we could interpret report card scores versus standardized test scores. So let's talk a little bit about this report um, assessment case study report. And again, all the information that you're going to see here is information that is um, in the assignment page on Canvas. So um, I'm just going to kind of go over this. So you'll choose one of seven cases to use for this paper. And they range in age from Charlie, who's in pre-kindergarten, to Marianne, who's in 11th grade. So pick a case that um, appeals to you and the type of class that you might want to teach when you're, you know, a teacher of your own. Um, again, the paper is going to be um, an APA format, double spacing, 12 inch font, one inch margins, um, all of those things. Um, okay, so you're going to have an introduction. Again, in that introduction, you want to provide a background for the case. Um, tell me a little bit about the rationale for the paper. This should just be like a short paragraph, no longer than a half a page. Then you're going to tell me the description of the, the data. But you're, the way you'll get the data is it will have each test reported individually. I do not want you to tell me her, the WIS score was blah, blah, blah. The, um, the PVVT score was blah, blah, blah. The COGAT score was blah, blah, blah. No, I want you to synthesize that data together. So tell me, what is the student's ability? Consider both the verbal and nonverbal intelligences separately. So tell me, this student was above average, or this student was below average, or this student scored average. Remember, when we're talking about above and below average, we're thinking in terms of standard deviation units, right? So if a student scored a 101 standard score, that's not above average, that's average, right? What's the student's level of creativity? There's only one score for that one, right? What's the student's achievement? For achievement, you're gonna think about both the COGAT, the FSAs, and the report cards. And then what's the student's language level? For that, you can consider the achievement scores. So you can think about the FSA and the COGAT um, ELA scores. You can also look at that PVVT. Then you're going to talk about the analysis of the data. For some of your students, the ability and the achievement scores are going to show us really similar results. And for some of them, there's going to be differences. I want you to talk about the similarities or differences in those scores and what might explain those differences or similarities. So is there special education status? Might it be motivation or language? And um, if they're consistent, tell me why you think they might be consistent. Then the next section is the evaluation of sources of the data. So um, think about the different sources. So why might you trust the WISC more than the COGAT? 
um, if my student has ADHD, then that WISC score is going to be a lot more important, right, than the COGAT, because I'm going to think the student's going to attend better when they're one-on-one. -on -one. However, if my student doesn't have any disabilities, the COGAT and the WISC is not going to make a difference, right? If I have an English language learner, then that TONY, that nonverbal score, is going to be a lot more reliable, a lot more valid than some of the other scores, right? So think about that. And think about if you think that the grades are a better indication of performance or the FSA scores. Um, so that's the first part of the evaluation scores. The second part is which test statistics um, are most effective. And again, they all say the same thing. A standard score tells me the same information as a percentile rank, but tell me which one you would report to parents and why. And then tell me your educational recommendations. There's two parts to this. The first part is tell me where do you think the students should be placed? Should they be in a gifted and talented program? Should they be in special education? Or they should, be the, should they be in a, in a typical classroom environment? So tell me why. And then the second one is what specific curricular interventions would be appropriate. So tell me, you know, I'm going to use manipulatives in the math class, and these are the ones I'm going to do. Tell me about a specific lesson you might do. Tell me exactly what you would do with your students in the classroom and in intervention. Remember, that's not going to be based upon those norm reference scores. That's got to be based upon those FSA or the report card scores, right? And then finally, you're going to end with a conclusion. Um, if you want, there's a page, there'll be a page like this in the assignment sheet. You can use this to kind of make sense of the data. You're not going to turn this in. Um, but it can help you kind of know about each of your tests. Okay, so please, as you're working on the standardized case study assignment, please let me know if you have any questions. Send me an email. I'm happy to meet with you in my office, or you can call me and we can talk on the phone. I'm happy to help you with this project, but you can't wait until the last minute because I'm not going to be available Sunday night to help you, right? So let me know early and I'll be happy to assist you with this project. And I look forward to reading all of your excellent analyses of your students' data. Have a great week. Bye.